break, so we'll just go ahead and get started. And thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we're hoping that you find some good information here. Tonight, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Thomas Van Deven. He's a practicing physician in Anacortes. And what I absolutely love is that he um, did a residency here at Skagit Regional and then he returned to the Valley. So yay, it's awesome to have functional medicine providers available, mainly because they get to the root of the issues and seem to really be able to facilitate better health and healing for so many amazing people. So let me click on this. So um, Dr. Van Deven is, um, I'm gonna let him tell you exactly where he's at, but um, you'll be able to track him uh, specifically um, through this uh, presentation tonight. And he's gonna start and then I'm gonna finish up with, with uh, some of my information. And I believe that what we both have to present tonight is gonna be very synergistic and very helpful but of course, if you ever have questions throughout any of this, there is a chat that you can uh, type in your questions to, and we'd be more than happy to answer those as we go. So feel free to um, type away however you need to. So here's a little bit about Dr. Van Deven. I think it's absolutely wonderful that he's been able to find some time tonight to join us. This is uh, certainly a pleasure to have him on board. And what I also really absolutely have heard amazing results from, from other practitioners, from other patients, is that he's able to find some root issues, hone in on that, and um, really find some great results. So Dr. Van Deven, thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. I'm really excited that you're here. And um, certainly, um, I think you'll be, I can stop sharing my slides and I think you'll be able to share yours. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Happy to be here. All right, let me share my screen. All right. Okay. Um, so the, the focus is really uh, multiple sclerosis, but it's also encompassing other autoimmune diseases. And we'll be touching on some LDN as well. Okay. I have so, a black screen, Dr. Van Deven. Oh, um, sharing is paused. It says sharing is paused. Hold on. Here, let me stop and start again. There we go. You see that now? Nope. As soon as you hit play, it went black. Oh, well, that's wild. Uh, hmm. All right. Well, uh, let's, we can always do it this way. Okay. Whatever is gonna work and it's gonna be amazing no matter what, so it'll be fine. Okay, all right. Um, so just get some distractions out of the way. <laughs> no uh, so autoimmune disease, you know, just moving forward with this is basically your body's uh, attack on itself. It gets confused on what's your, your real self tissue and what is foreign. And so a lot of different tissues in the body look like other substances, which we would normally want to attack and remove. In this case, in multiple sclerosis, it's the myelin sheath. It's that protective fatty coating around the nerve, which helps it with moving signals, electrical conduction down its pathway to transfer information back and forth. Uh, there are some genetic predispositions. We know some information. I'm sure more will come out with time. Um, HLA DR2 and DR4, as well as HLA B27. But these are really just uh, predispositions. These are things that 
that make us prone to having an autoimmune disease, but there always needs to be some kind of trigger, something that really initiates that process and moves us into a state of disease. So some of those triggers and associations, you know, we're looking at anything that creates inflammation or oxidation. So we're looking at the, in the environment, what toxins we're being exposed to, whether they be, you know, combinations of pesticides or mold, as well as different infections and heavy metals. And this is in a, a general sense for a lot of autoimmune conditions. In MS specifically, we do see that EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, also known as mono or the, the kissing disease, which most of us got either as teenagers or maybe even as children, you know, as our family members gave us a, a big wet one when we were a kid because we were so cute. And, you know, those things can actually be reactivated. We see a, a term called reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. Um, there's also a thought to be an association and maybe more information will come out in the future with other infections related to MS, such as Lyme and chlamydia pneumoniae. Metals that have been associated include uh, aluminum, but lead and mercury also are known to damage the nervous system. So these are things that can build up over time. Uh, nutritionally, we do know that vitamin D deficiency is a factor and those at the latitude where, where we're broadcasting from today, you know, we have less sunshine than, than the average Joe, maybe moving down south, you know, closer to Mexico, for example. So there is a higher incidence of MS in this area thought to be related to vitamin D because vitamin D actually regulates um, part of the T cells of our immune system. So without the vitamin D there, things can go into the wrong direction. But also not recognized and appreciated, I think, much as much as it needs to be is trauma. You know, that could be an emotional trauma, that could be a physical trauma, a mental trauma, anything that really stirs up the, the nervous system, especially, because there's a lot of crosstalk between the different systems of the body, the endocrine system, the nervous system, the immune system, and, and so on. Stress is another big one. At the patients that I've seen that have autoimmune disease, almost every one of them have had a major trauma or traumas, as well as lots and lots of stress, either triggering their disease or maybe even keeping them into this cycle. So we're looking at what's happening in their life and how they're working with that. Um, on the right, you see a picture of uh, mononucleosis. You see those two cells that are much bigger and kind of purplish. So multiple sclerosis, as I mentioned, it's really a demyelination. So the myelin gets degraded because the, there are antibodies the immune system is attacking that and breaking it down. So it, they're not able to move the signals as quickly and easily down its pathway, which leads to a number of symptoms, you know, poor vision, numbness, weakness, tingling of the arms or legs, trouble with bladder control, difficulty walking, poor concentration, dizziness, hearing loss, difficulties with speech, and of course, nerve-related pain. And all these things seem to kind of come and go, you know, there may not really be a rhyme to a reason, but they might show up one day, get really bad and maybe settle down and maybe even kind of disappear for a little while as other symptoms come and go. So treatment, we have lots of possibilities for treatment, um, diet, you know, and this is, keep in mind, this is my approach to autoimmune disease. So Conventionally, there are a lot of uh, corticosteroids and things to reduce inflammation. There are disease modifying agents where they're trying to reduce the immune activity of the body, you know, muscle relaxants for muscle spasms, physical therapy to get the body moving. So this is, you know, in, in combo with that as I'm working with someone. But what I'm doing in my clinic um, is looking at these factors. We're looking at diet, you know, food triggers are a big piece, you know, food sensitivities, they don't necessarily have to be a full celiac issue, but gluten, dairy, and eggs are probably the most common sensitivities we see. You know, correcting that by taking those out and healing the gut, and that's a whole other lecture. Um, autoimmune paleo diet is removing foods that are more likely to be triggering an immune and inflammatory response. Uh, fasting has been shown very promising as that stimulates um, different levels of um, cells to reproduce and actually stimulate regeneration of different parts of the body. 
uh, vitamin D, as we mentioned, and specific to MS is the WALS protocol, which I'll touch more on in just a little bit. Low dose naltrexone, which is something that I know that Michelle provides at the pharmacy and does well with that. That's, that's been a tremendous help to patients um, in helping to reduce their pain, improve their mood, and you know, largely by reducing the inflammation by stimulating the body's natural ability to produce opi opioids and increasing, increasing endorphins. So a lot of those feel good hormones, you, you feel good when you're done doing an exercise, for example. So it's helpful for, for mood as well, mood and sleep, pain, all these things that tend to really weigh on someone and um, sometimes prevent them from being able to work. Um, also need to look at hormones, you know, cortisol, that stress response hormone, as well as balancing the sex hormones like estriol and all the estrogens um, have an anti-inflammatory effect. And we're trying to catch what could be a runaway train. So we're looking at all sources. Um, infections, like I mentioned, you want to find those and treat those. And there are a number of ways to do that. Um, identify heavy metals. So there are, there are blood tests and urine tests you can do to look for those both for immediate exposure um, within the last maybe weeks or months, but also a total body burden, what you may have accumulated over your lifetime. As far as toxins, we're looking also at mold. You know, this area has a lot of mold. Um, I've been in practice here for just about two months. My practice is building quickly and I have a number of mold patients already and I'm sure I'll see many more so that's something that I think is under-recognized and thereby not identified or treated, unfortunately. And other toxins in the environment, pesticides and environmental pieces. Uh, stress reduction, you always need to look at that. That's going to create lots of problems in all of the systems of the body. So, you know, looking at uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, various forms of meditation, but also looking at the limbic system specifically. And there are a couple of programs that do well with this. Um, one is the DNRS, which is Dynamic Neural Retraining System, and there's a similar system called Gupta. Um, you could also do EMDR, which is uh, kind of a form of psychotherapy where you're able to access traumas in a, a deeper way while they're either moving your eyes laterally or sometimes kind of tapping with your hand or finger. And then the last thing, which one of my specialties is also osteopathic manipulative medicine, which I'll talk more about in a moment. So, uh, you know, kudos to Dr. Walls. She herself has MS. Um, she was pretty debilitated, as you can see in that photo from October of 2007. And she got to a point where she wasn't getting better with the latest drugs. And so she basically kind of tried to, to hack her own system. She looked at her own biology. She looked at what she thought might be related to the problem. And she started to create a diet to give herself the nutrients and nutrition to kind of move her forward. So she was looking at lots of vegetables, you know, to feed the mitochondria. She believed the mitochondrial dysfunction was a big part of multiple sclerosis. So foods that also feed the membranes, upregulate detox pathways and have sufficient protein. So in doing so, she improved her energy, her quality of life, her motor function. She was up, you know, just a year later riding a bike you know, she still has her challenges, but she's a very active person and she's, she's a hero for many people with MS. So check out uh, Terry Walls and her Walls protocol. And then the other aspect is osteopathic medicine. And this is something most people wouldn't really associate with autoimmune disease. But what we're looking to do from that standpoint is normalize the nervous system. So when the autonomic nervous system is engaged and reactive, it's going to create this fight or flight mechanism, which creates more problems with the gut. It's pro-inflammatory. It ruins our sleep. It, it just has this cascade effect in all the systems of the body. And there's a physical component. You have to remember that the nerves and the nervous system is a physical thing. It's an it's a operating uh, structure. And so those structures could also be um, traumatized, truly. So old falls, car accidents, various other things could actually create problems with the structure of the body, stimulate the nerves and the nervous system to keep you in a state of fight or flight or stimulate anxiety, not just create pain. 
And so we can work with that as that where those nerves are in some of these old injuries that may have never healed from years ago to release the stress on the nervous system to give it a chance to breathe and to finally heal. Um, also, we're looking at helping the body move. You know, movement is probably the underlying principle of osteopathy. In this case, we're helping the joints move, we're helping fluid movement, which is the lymphatic system, the arterial system, the venous system. Every fluid needs to move easily throughout the body to have homeostasis and health. So we're working with all of that. Um, and force factors, like I mentioned in the slide, that's really um, the effect of a trauma. So when you fall, just a matter of physics, that the impact of that fall or a blow to the shoulder or striking your head against something, the, the force of that can actually stay in the tissue and in the body, suspending the anatomy in that trauma in a way that creates a lot of tension and dysfunction as it affects the nerves and it affects the blood supply and thereby the function of the body, of not just the muscles, but, but the organs themselves. <laughs> that, that's one thing that most people just it just doesn't click, is that we're actually manipulating every tissue and fluid of the body. So Dr. Van Devin, sorry to interrupt, but do you find that some of these traumas are issues that have happened maybe several years or maybe even decades ago? I mean, are those, those are some of the issues that you're able to treat? Yes. Um, some of them are actually sometimes prenatal. You know, if mom was in an accident, or a birth trauma, if there was a difficult delivery, sometimes those strains on their body and on their nervous system can, can stay with someone for their entire life if it doesn't have an opportunity to release and heal. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So. That's, that's wow. Yeah, it is wow. It, it's, it's, it's so rewarding too, to work with someone and find these pieces and actually help them through the healing process because they're, there will that may have otherwise gone completely unknown, unseen, and unhealed, and hold someone in a in an unhealthy pattern that can manifest in so many different ways, if, even including autoimmune disease. It can actually be a stimulus to move someone down that pathway. So, like you said, you know, functional medicine is about finding root cause. Osteopathic medicine is doing the same. You know, looking from a different perspective, working with the physical body in that way, which also creates function. So, yeah, yeah, there's a lot to it. Um, so my, my part is kind of short and sweet. That's all I have. Um, if you want to, you can find me at, at uh, drbandevin.com and I'm in Anacortis. So um, you're welcome to look me up. I'm happy to help. Well, I can't thank you enough for being here tonight. Um, it's, it truly is wonderful to have you as a resource so that I can, you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised at how many people come into the pharmacy or call and say they just need some help because they've been through, you know, so many doctors over so many years and they just are not getting enough help. And, and they might already be on quite a few or several conventional medications, but they just don't seem to work very well. And, you know, I've been a pharmacist for 34 years and, um, you know, so I'm, I'm trained in, in that side of things, but I am finding that when medication only has a, you know, 30% effectiveness rate, well, that means that 70% of the people are not going to respond. So, you know, and quite honestly, you know, blood pressures, high blood pressure is not a lack of lisinopril. So, you know, we got to be able to get to the root of the issues. So, and I, and I do know how, at least with me personally, how, when I've used even chiropractic or, or acupuncture, things change. So to then go down the road of osteopathic manipulation, I can imagine that's really the best of, of, all those worlds all put together. So I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. Like we a do have one question in the chat. Um, so someone from Ferndale, Washington joined and they asked, does LDN help in reducing cortisol levels and are cortisol levels typically high during autoimmune flare-ups? 
That is a great question. Um, and let's see here. I think um, Dr. Van Devin, do you need to stop sharing your screen before I can jump in there? I'm not sure. Um, I, think I, I think I did. Okay, I will try to get back in there then. So Lodos now Trexone, if I can get my slides to pull up here. There we go. So we will definitely jump into um, how Lodos now Trexone actually works. And so to not jump too far ahead, but LDN works on a wide variety of pathways. And what's very interesting about that drug is that, yes, it's a prescription medication and it works for a lot of people in various realms. It's not a cure-all. And most of the time it's not um, a sole entity. So in other words, it's not the only medication that we're gonna try, or it's not the only modality that we're gonna try. The bottom line is, is that LDN tricks the body into using its natural mechanisms to then help reduce inflammation, increase endorphins, modulate the immune system, and work on those very specific anti-inflammatory pathways that it truly manipulates. And that is actually a myriad of cascade of other kind of uh, snowball kind of effects in how it then will change thyroid function, sex steroid hormone function, cortisol, et cetera. So I will say that it, I don't believe LDN directly like one-on-one -on -one changes cortisol levels, but what it can do is by decreasing very specific cytokines or chemicals that cause inflammation in the body, you can then reduce cortisol. So it's not a direct head to head, you know, cause and effect correlation. It's kind of a cascade of correlation. And, and Dr. Van Devin went over um, exactly what is uh, MS and he did this incredibly well. So I'm gonna go through these next couple of slides um, a, little, a little quicker. And I love that Dr. Van Devin actually touched on a wide variety of environmental issues because quite honestly, um, the one thing that I think conventional medicine, if we wanna call it that, maybe even completely ignores is some of the issues that perhaps we have a parasite growing in our gut or um, a dysbiosis, meaning we've got some offenders in there that are maybe taking over and, and, and squeezing out the good guys. Or sometimes we're, we're exposed to heavy metals that we um, maybe aren't um, completely aware of. And that's a, a really big deal. But the one thing that we can do is we can take a look at how we genetically are built. And just because we have a certain matrix of DNA, we don't necessarily have to turn all of that on and some of it we can actually turn back off. So it's always a great idea to know exactly what's going on with your genetics so that you can make better decisions for yourself. And what I mean by that is that if you know whether or not you have a genetic predisposition to completely activate your B vitamins. So in other words, maybe you have a genetic predisposition where you don't activate your, your B vitamins, then you have, then, you know, and then you can take the activated forms. But if you do activate them, you don't necessarily want to take the activated forms because sometimes that can lead to other excitatory components. And um, we certainly don't want to set you up for other issues down the line. But because of where we live, um, you know, we live in a, if you're in Skagit, Whatcom, even Snohomish County, it's a very large environmental um, aggregate of um, areas where we grow a wide variety of crops, right? So agriculture is a really big deal. So whether it is growing uh, food crops or whether it is uh, growing uh, beef or milk cattle, 
That is a really big deal because of the hormones that are used and because of the fertilizers and pesticides. And you've, you've probably all seen the commercials for, um, du, you know, Monsanto DuPont, um, which in my professional opinion is one of the biggest bad guys that are out there. So we all know that spraying Roundup is just not a good idea. And what I will say is, especially to the guys in the audience, it's really not a good idea because a lot of times you're holding that sprayer at waist level and um, it can be absorbed through your gloves. And a lot of times if you put your sprayer down and then go in and go to the bathroom, whether or not you wash, I mean, even if you wash your hands really, really well, you may not get all of that Roundup off. And I personally know of um, two individuals in the area that are very young people who have actually developed um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, most likely due to Roundup exposure. So it's very interesting that we cannot ignore the environment that we live in. We're inundated with plastics every single day. We are inundated with um, xenoestrogens or estrogen-like components, even on our cash register receipts. So we, we have to pay attention to that. And in my professional opinion, I believe that it is better to know, and then you can make better decisions for yourself. I think that just makes a lot more sense. So you can get some really great genetic testing. And this is done, um, the one provider that I know of in the area, her name is Tony Marthaler. And she is a consultant for 3X4 Genetics. It is very easy. It's simply just a cheek swab. Um, you send it off, prepaid postage, away it goes. And then a few weeks later, you get this tremendous amount of information. They look at 36 different core insights that then relate to how inflamed is your body? How inflamed is your brain? What's going on with your nutrient status? How well do you actually metabolize foods? How well do you metabolize your nutrients? But it also looks at what's going on with your organs. Is your liver actually metabolizing appropriately and detoxifying, or is it maybe a little clogged up? It also uh, takes a brief overview of what's going on with your hormones. Although you can look at hormone levels in a wide variety of other testing as well, like saliva or even um, a dry urine test. I like those tests a little bit better than I do serum. And the reason is, is because what we know about saliva testing and urine testing is that it gives us a little bit closer idea to what is happening in the cell, but also what the cells are doing with those hormones and then excreting those. Whereas if we're just looking at what the um, hormones levels are doing in the serum or in the blood, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like identifying how many cars are on the freeway because the freeway is literally moving your car from point A to point B. Well, your, your blood supply is moving your hormones from point A to point B. So it just tells you a little bit about how much hormone is there, but it doesn't tell you what it's actually going on and what's being stored or how your body is utilizing it. So I think there's better hormone testing than just using serum. Um, what I also like about the three by four genetics testing is that it gives you insights as to how well your body adapts to exercise. So for example, should you be a marathon runner or should you be really paying attention to exercising in shorter bursts because it will metabolically take into account how prone you are to injury and also to recovery and healing. I love those, con those connections because again, you can make really good decisions for yourself because I don't think anybody ever wants to be in their 60s, 70s and beyond toting a huge suitcase full of medications and not being able to move or remember what's going on. You know, the bottom line is we all want to live as young as possible for as long as possible. So I feel that this is a really good test to help you gauge where you're at so that you can 
maybe change your diet, maybe take a look at uh, what nutrients you need to replace, what kinds of exercise are best for you, and also to then move out of some of those toxic environments into better environments and allow your organs to detoxify. Super important. So again, Dr. Van Deven talked a lot about the different types of triggers of autoimmune and, um, you know, diet's huge. And a lot of times we don't like to give up our foods because a lot of times we have this, you know, really, um, close connection to certain foods and yeah, they can be comforting at times, but a lot of times we have to be really, really careful about what those foods are actually telling us. So here's a funny little story. Um, I have a daughter who, uh, when she was in college, she used to like to crack open a can of green beans. I don't know why, but she would crack open that can of green beans and she'd eat them right out of the can. And she would eat them when she would study. And she actually felt that she was studying better. She would retain the information better. Well, come to find out, she also had this really funny rash that would kind of pop out around her mouth. Um, and I, I've, I made a comment about it one day when we were FaceTiming, I said, you know, what, what's going on here? And, and by the way, this was way before COVID. We're talking about like night, uh, 2013, 2014. So a long time ago, right? And she had this rash and it was kind of pimply and whatever. And I said, what's going on here? She goes, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but she was telling me how she did really, really well on this test. And she started contributing, doing really well on these tests to eating these green beans. And I asked her, I, I flat out said, you know, do you feel high when you, you know, do you feel euphoric when you eat these green beans? And she, she kind of thought maybe she did. Well, I asked her to stop eating the green beans for about a week. And she actually came home on spring break and, and, we, she didn't have any beans whatsoever. So no green beans, no other legumes whatsoever. And the rash cleared up. And she has a wide variety of other uh, food allergies as well. I mean, she's allergic to carrots. She's allergic to melons. She's allergic to all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, come to find out, we did some other food testing and we looked at some other triggers and voila, she's allergic to legumes and beans. So what was happening is that she was actually eating that and it was causing this euphoria, this chemical reaction that actually made her feel kind of happy and, and high. Well, but in what was happening further down the line is it was changing what was going on in her gut and it was reducing the amount of serotonin or, or happy chemical down the line. So it was kind of this rebound effect. And um, so she doesn't eat green beans anymore, which is a, a really good thing. But that's just one of those funny little things with diets and triggers. Other people with other autoimmune diseases will often tell me that um, they feel moody or depressed or foggy thinking um, after they eat certain foods. And that's definitely a trigger or um, uh, an idea that maybe they should have some more food testing done. And there's a wide variety of testing that can be done and it's not tremendously expensive, but it's not usually the pin pricky stuff that they do on your back. That's a different, different, um, illicit of, um, a different measurement of, uh, a different part of the, um, autoimmune cascade, or excuse me, the, um, uh, allergic reaction cascade. That's very different than when you eat a food. That's a, a totally different part of the allergic area. So yeah, you don't want to do the pin pricky thing. That's different. You don't rub your foods on your skin to eat. You eat them, you put them in your mouth, you swallow them um, and they affect your gut. And also sometimes medications can have a very specific trigger and it's not necessarily always the active ingredient in medications as much as the inactive ingredients in medications. So for example, um, I know quite a few people that have Hashimoto thyroiditis and sometimes they're kind of a mix of um, Hashimoto and Graves, but they might take a medication that is, you know, prescribed for them. They commercially get that at their regular pharmacy, but it contains lactose. Well, if they also have a dairy and or casein or lactose intolerance, their medication could possibly cause them to react as well. 
that will raise cortisol levels that can actually trigger uh, flares. And so we have to be really careful about that. So again, Dr. Van Deven went over this incredibly well. Um, vitamin D def deficiency, you know, I think that March and October are my favorite times to actually test for vitamin D deficiency. And unfortunately, most insurance is not covering that right now. Um, I'm not really sure why, because I do believe that if we kept vitamin D in its optimal range, we could resolve a wide variety of issues. But um, especially if you're Medicare age, vitamin D testing usually isn't covered, but always check with your provider or um, your ancillary provider, such as Dr. Van Deven, because a lot of times um, your specialist will be able to have access to better pricing with a wide variety of testing. So you don't necessarily have to go to LabCorp or sometimes you do go to LabCorp, but you might get a better deal than what your regular insurance will, will cover. Um, Epstein-Barr uh, Epstein viral infection, it can be identified as well. And that's very important to do. Um, and of course, if you smoke, well, that's just something that um, we encourage everybody to try to forego. Um, there is a very, very strong correlation and connection between what is going on in your gut and what's going on in your brain. So if you eat foods that you have a sensitivity to, it can actually change the inner lining, the skin layer in your, in your gut, and it can open those junctions up, which allow bigger molecules to pass through. And it might be even just your regular metabolites of uh, how you're breaking down your foods even that will then pass through that area. Maybe it'll land up on your skin, but a lot of times it'll actually cross into the brain and then cause other chemical reactions that can have a wide variety of symptoms. And we're know, we know a lot more about what's going on in the gut. In fact, this, was, this study was done back in 2002, but there is more and more research that is not as old, if you wanna say, um, that clearly demonstrates how if you take care of your gut, you'll be much more apt to be able to take care of the rest of your body. And Dr. David Perlmutter's book, Grain Brain, is a very easy read. And this is actually an excerpt from page 58 that um, in, he specifically talks about that. The other book that I really like is um, Wheat Belly, which was written by a cardiologist and I for, uh, forgive me, I completely forget his name, but if you want to really easy to read books that specifically talk about the connection between what is going on in your gut and what's going on elsewhere, these are quick and easy reads. Um, yeah, this was a little bit of research that I found specifically on um, gluten sensitivities and a wide variety of MS patients that they could show on MRI scans to the point where in a controlled group, they removed gluten from the diet and then they rescanned six months later and most of those uh, MS lesions were gone. Can't, can't beat that. When we look at a wide variety of treatments for MS, we, are, we do see some information specifically on oral Estriol. So estriol is the third metabolite or the third estrogen in the body. It is the weakest estrogen in the body. It has an amazing affinity for the vaginal vault, but it also seems to be neuroprotective. Estriol is the major estrogen that surrounds baby in the amniotic fluid. And it tends to be, um, uh, it seems to reduce a wide variety of inflammatory markers. Um, we also see 4-aminopyridine. So this is a commercially available called Ampira in a 10 milligram extended release tablet. And we've actually been compounding a wide variety of this and combine it with other therapies as well um, because Ampira tends to be, again, super expensive and a lot of times isn't covered by insurance, um, which is going to keep people from treating their, their, uh, their disease. And then we also see the natural uh, vitamin called biotin, and we have compounded this in very high doses because it has really good antioxidant properties. The one caveat with biotin that I need to throw out there is that 
if you are going to use biotin and you are having your blood drawn to look at thyroid markers, you need to be off biotin for about two weeks before you have your labs drawn. Otherwise it can um, detrimentally affect your TSH and it won't register quite right. And therefore your labs won't, won't recognize uh, truly what's going on in your body. But when we look at low dose naltrexone, so we, we know that naltrexone in higher doses is very effective uh, to help individuals decrease their cravings for alcohol and certain drugs. But in very low doses, and I'm talking about 0.5 to 4.5 milligram, what we've been able to see is that this study specifically directly correlated the use of low-dose naltrexone in the improvement of quality of life because it reduced a wide variety of symptoms by decreasing inflammation throughout the body. So specifically in this study, it showed that there were less muscle spasms less issues with bladder spasms and less um, changes with the optic nerve. So people's double and triple vision was, was uh, I, I don't wanna say it was perfectly corrected, but it was improved dramatically. What we also know is that in other randomized placebo control trials, which is specifically what a wide variety of physicians are going to look for, is that um, again, quality of life is improved. Now, low dose naltrexone does not cure anything, but it does decrease inflammation throughout the entire body. So no matter if we're dealing with the nerve specifically associated with your parameters and um, specific symptoms with MS, or if we're decreasing inflammation throughout the entire body and also modulating the immune system. So we're not overcorrecting the immune system. We're not hyper extending the immune system, but we're actually helping it to naturally uh, modulate. So uh, find its new normal or its new happy. But we can also see where naltrexone will increase endorphins, which are natural painkillers in the body. Anytime that we can see that, we're going to see better quality of life, not just in multiple sclerosis, but in any autoimmune issue or just in any um, uh, side effect or sorry, symptom profile. So we also see that a lot of times when someone is recently diagnosed, they have a long list of symptoms and there are other compounded medications that we can use to help decrease those symptoms while LDN takes effect. Or if you are going to use a biologic, um, we can use all of this together. So we do compound oxybutyn and we actually put oxybutynin in a transdermal gel, meaning it's in a um, kind of a, a really cool cream base that can be applied around the urethra so that it can decrease the spasm. We can also apply that in the pubic area. And again, the medication will go directly through um, to the muscle wall of the bladder and decrease its spasming. When we do that, we use a transdermal product. We usually don't see the anticholinergic side effects as if you were to take that product orally. So if you took oxybutynin orally, you would probably see dry mouth, dry eyes, constipation. You might be dizzy, woozy, tired. Um, and we don't see that when we use a transdermal gel. So even though this is compounded in an 8% transdermal gel, you're actually applying much less. So you're getting a very small a dose and that small dose is, uh, can be very effective. Uh, sometimes we're seeing that this oxybutynin transdermal gel will keep you from having to use um, uh, catheters. So muscle stiffness, muscle pain, we use magnesium topically. We actually add guaifenesin. So most of you probably know guaifenesin is robitussin, which you take when you've got lung congestion. Well, it also decreases a wide variety of muscle spasming. So, uh, and we use that in the veterinary world quite, quite frequently. 
Sometimes when we have a wide variety of autoimmune issues, we also see some sexual dysfunction. So for men specifically, we will add Tadalafil in a uh, trochee, which is a small disc that can be dissolved underneath the tongue. And then we add this pyridoxal 5-phosphate is the activated form of vitamin B6. And we actually see better um, better erection, better force with, um, with ejaculation and, and longer erection times. So it seems to work very well for a wide variety of men. We can also add flavor to that trochee so that we get away from the bitterness. Um, pyridoxal 5-phosphate is kind of a school bus yellow color. So we, we want to warn people ahead of time, but it doesn't usually stain the inside of the mouth. For women, we use papaverine and a little bit of arginine, and we generally use that in a transdermal gel, and that can be um, applied to the clitoral area or even inside the labia, and that seems to work very well. Um, it, it needs to be rubbed in well so that it's not transmitted to partners as well, because that's not necessarily sharing, isn't always caring. And then we always want to take a look at what exactly is going on with uh, sex hormones throughout the years. If you are diagnosed when you are young, if you're diagnosed with MS or an autoimmune when you're in your 20s, it's still a good idea to get a really good baseline hormone level. And again, I like to look at that in saliva. So a base panel of saliva hormone levels Let's see, if we look at estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, and a morning and night cortisol, that runs $200. It's very easy to do. If you are menstruating, we need to time that just right during your cycle. Otherwise, you can do that anytime uh, during your cycle or anytime during the month. And for men, it doesn't matter. You can do that anytime. For gentlemen, we tend to look for some other issues as well. So we might look at sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, to ensure that you um, have enough sex hormone binding globulin to actually carry the testosterone to the target tissues. Because anytime that estrogen goes up, then sex hormone binding globulin goes down, and that means testosterone is more active. So we want to stay away from causing any acne issues or hair growth where you not necessarily want that to be. And we also want to stay away from some of the other unwanted symptoms like aggravation, irritability, and uh, mood changes. And we can see that in men and women. So, you know, we've had virtual teachers for a really long time, and these are some of my favorite, favorite people. Um, I want to thank everybody tonight for joining us. And I don't um, Scarlett, help me out. I don't see that we have any other questions in the chat room, but this is how you can get a hold of us. And if you didn't write down how to get a hold of Dr. Van Devin, you're welcome to get a hold of us at the store and we will happily pass on information, um, his contact information, his phone number, et cetera, and how you can get a hold of him and make an appointment with him. Our upcoming seminars in April, we will be talking about inflammation and gut health. So it's a, a very easy segue and transition from this talk. We'll be talking about chronic pain in LDN in, again in May. And in June, we're gonna talk about men's health. As always, if you need any help with supplements or if you need help um, just even organizing your regular medications or if you have questions, give us a call at the store. We're happy to help with that as well. Any other questions in the chat room tonight? Nope, we don't have any other questions. If anybody has some remaining questions, feel free to type them in now, or you could unmute yourself and feel free to ask directly. Yeah. Um, but I'll also be sending out an email so you can feel free to just respond directly to that. And I can connect you with either Dr. Van Devin or Michelle, whomever needs to answer that. I'm happy to, happy to help that way as well. Uh, I did see one question come through a little bit ago about asking about soy. Um, I, I'll just address that briefly. So soy is uh, also a food that some people are sensitive to. I'm not usually as often as uh, gluten, soy, and uh, gluten, dairy, and eggs, excuse me. But, uh, but that's certainly one thing that is often taken out of the diet if you're going through an elimination diet where you're removing the most common uh, food sensitivities. 
Um, there's just, and to add on to what Michelle was saying about the food sensitivity testing, there are a number of ways to do that. There are a number of labs which have different technologies and different methods. Um, you just have to be careful. You know, some are actually more helpful than others. Some, um, I, I'll just say it. I, I, if I do it, I use a company called Cyrex. And sure. the reason I, and the reason I do is because they, they, they test the sample more than once, at least twice to validate their internal result, results. So it's not a random chance. They make sure that what they're receiving and the results are actually consistent. And they also test both raw and cooked versions of the same food item, where many of the food sensitivity tests only do one or the other. And I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone that only eats cooked or only eats raw. So it's good to have that full spectrum. Um, and they do a number of things. It's not just to foods, but they can, they even have uh, panels that are related to autoimmune disease, um, Alzheimer's and a number of things. So there's a lot of different applications. Um, just depends on, you know, what you're looking for and what you want to learn. And Dr. Van Devin brings up a really good point because you can access a wide variety of tests out there. And sometimes you will um, pick up a test because you're really curious about something that's going on. And I always encourage patients to have a very good conversation with your medical provider before you do that. Because the bottom line is, yes, it's great to have information about yourself, but not all tests are created equal. Um, as Dr. Van Deven said, there's some of them are much better than others. So you, if you're going to be spending your hard earned money on something, make sure you're getting the best that you can afford. But if you don't have a conversation with your provider ahead of time, then when you have these results, you may not know how to interpret those or what steps to take next. And so your provider is going to want to be able to help you with that. Of course, if you, um, if you get a look back from your, your provider, like a deer in the headlights, then let us know how we can help you. I know Dr. Van Deven can help you. Um, and that might be a, a, another way to find uh, another provider that can help you in other ways. And so what I'm saying is not to change providers entirely, but a lot of times when we have complex medical issues, we need more medical professionals on our side to help us navigate our pathway to better health. Absolutely. Yeah. I thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, I just uh, really look forward to um, continuing to send patients your direction because I uh, all of the ones that we've sent you so far have reported back that they're feeling really good and they're, they're getting somewhere. And when a patient comes in and they said, you know, for the first time in many, many years, I've been through several doctors and I'm just not getting anywhere. But yet when I've gone to see Dr. Van Deven, he honed right in on some of the issues that I was having and I didn't even tell him first, but he picked up on it right away. That's amazing. That's, that's, that's just fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. So thanks everybody for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of us at the store, get a hold of Dr. Van Deven, and we're always happy to help. If you would like to register for upcoming uh, webinars, you're welcome to do that. It's never too early and there, we always have room for you. So um, you can do that here at makerscompounding.com backslash webinars, and we'll see you next time. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Good night.